So, hey YouTube, uh, we're back again, and I was working on this shape last week, you know, as a Sunday fool around thing with mop booleans and that kind of stuff, and I thought, this is actually a pretty good example to talk about the normals, or the object space normal map uh, workflow that I've been using lately. Um, so for a little bit of history, I've been talking this up on the Discord for far too long now, and to be honest, it's going to be pretty underwhelming when you actually see what I'm talking about, but you know, it's almost become a meme at this point because I've been delaying it so long. So I figured we should just get it out of the way. So my plan for today is we're going to take this prop and we're going to low poly it, you know, UV it. And my plan right now is to do it twice. I'll do it once in the more or less correct fashion so that the silhouette maintains and everything. And then we'll do another version that's just like stupidly optimized you know i meant to be seen from maybe like this far back or something and that should give us two examples that we can look at the bake results in and you'll see what i'm talking about in terms of how you don't have to worry about vertex normals and that kind of stuff so uh we're gonna low poly it here in a minute and uh we'll get this thing rolling so to get the low poly process started i have done what I usually do. I will go ahead and um, you know make a separate uh, parent item. I'll throw all the high poly stuff inside of it, it's just just for organizational purposes. And just to show you the way that I would normally approach this, were this like a prop I was doing for like a game or something, I would. I I tend to duplicate the high poly folder. I'll, I'll give it a quick rename to, to HPX, so I know that this is the exploded version. Now I will go in here, and if I grab these pieces here and I move them out, and I try to pick some sort of a, you know, a rational distance on this drag, we'll do negative 25. I, I tend to do multiples of 25 or 50 or whatever, so I know that when I put them back together again, it's fast. You know, because I don't have to think about you know how far it was or try to scooch things in and eyeball it. Now, I know what you're going to say. I should probably use a morph map for this, but I really actually don't like that workflow. I find that to be kind of a pain in the butt because you have to like, like setting up the morph map is obviously easy enough, but each time you want to bake, you have to, to apply the morph map because the motor renderer, uh, it doesn't see the morph map when it goes to render out the... Uh, the normal maps, uh, which is a real hassle because then you have to apply the vertex or apply the morph map, do the bake, then apply it in reverse to get back to where you were. Otherwise you have an exploded mesh for all time. And I just, I just avoid all of that and just make it my own. You know, you know, I just go ahead and just explode by hand. So anyway, uh, that was a bit of a divergence. So I've exploded these out. Now the rest of this, I don't have a big problem just baking as one big lump or chunk because most of this is surface detail. So that sounds fine. Now this has a couple of mop booleans on it. We have this general casing here and we have this plating here. Uh, but the good news is that since this plating is, is going to get baked out flat, uh, I don't actually need this one. So we're just going to delete that um, sorry, what am I doing? Um, uh, my mind is racing ahead to the low poly. Uh, we need this in the high poly, obviously. So to get this started, I will grab, let's just grab this mesh item here and we'll call this low poly one. Cause like I said, we're probably going to do two versions of this for fun. Okay. So to get started, we'll grab that background plate and just paste it into the low poly. So now I've isolated the low poly. Now I do have a special uh, material setup that lives inside of my, uh, you know, my default scene. So if I apply the low poly preset, you see I get this splugy mess here. And that's this material right here. If I pull up the properties on that, you see it's got the blue color, you know, spec and roughness, but the only thing that matters to to game artists is this section down here. 
the uh, smoothing, smooth angle, this kind of stuff. Um, I find that 179 works fine because that puts it all into one big smoothing group. I turn off all these, turn this off, you know, crease by hard edges, all that jazz. It's mostly just shutting everything off because when you bake an object space normal map, it it you know it doesn't need face weighting, it doesn't need vertex normals really. It just needs an averagely smoothed mesh. So it eliminates a lot of hassle. So uh, we're going to tear the back off of this because I don't you know really care about that. And we're going to use this as our uh, rough starting point for this low poly. Okay, so luckily this is a pretty simplistic prop and we have that back plate, we have these two little things and we have the main body. So obviously the fastest thing to do would be to grab these little bits here. So we'll just grab the one because they're both the same and give it a low poly material. And now it's just a matter of, of ripping out all the pieces that we don't actually need on the low poly mesh as per, you know, standard operating procedure and I can kill this loop probably yeah likely I could we'll just leave it for now we'll kill the one in the back maybe because you know you uh, you're not going to notice that we will that's not what I said I said edge relax thank you use edge relax to put him in an optimal position kill the back poly because you know that's sitting up against the plate so who cares and we'll quantify that front face this is probably still more high poly than it needs to be but I'm not going to concern myself too much with it it's you know, not that critical for this demo drag this down snap him into place you know what actually let's not do that now let's uh let's wait since they're both the same uh they're going to get uv the same so we'll just wait till the uv stage to copy that down uh, what we do need to do now though is we need to get this back body uh, uh, built out so some quick techie your know, information about mop booleans so when you have a mop boolean and you open it up you'll see this is green item inside here the green item is the procedural mesh that's where all of these operations and all of these drivers the end result is this green mesh and you can select the polygons on it and you, know, you have a look at it now if i go to move those polygons moto complains oh there's no there's no active layer you know, yada yada all the stuff it usually complains about with uh, mesh operations but what you can do is you can copy which gives you all those polygons on the clipboard now, in this case, it's a relatively straightforward setup or a, a result from the Boolean, so I'm not going to worry about getting fancy, but there's some tricks you can do there to reduce the polygons that you've copied. Like you can take all of your your Boolean operators down to their lowest subdivision level first you know, before copying them out and things like that. But we'll get into that in a future video. Actually, I might have already shown that in the past, but anyway, it's... It's not a topic for right now. So I'll paste those polygons into my low poly. And now they're sitting here. And once again, we'll give them all the low poly material. And if I isolate those, you'll be to start to, uh, to rip this down into a low poly state that will be acceptable for the prop. Now, when it comes to this kind of thing, you don't need to be all that careful, but you do need to just you know, follow the same basic rules you would always follow. You know, I know that I can simplify that by doing that. And then, you know, we can split across there to reestablish that quad. And that pretty much puts that into place. It's the usual rules of trying to make sure that anything that affects the silhouette needs to stay. So that bump actually does affect the silhouette yes in a small way and when we do the you know the mega optimized version you know we'll you know we'll talk about some other alternatives for that but for this piece here where i care about the silhouette we're going to keep those now, these interior corners we can cut those down by half by you know, doing the every second edge things you know, kill them off i could probably do the same here 
and the prop would probably hold up yeah let's do it why not kill those and then we really only have to deal with these cuts up here uh, these things over here this is what i wanted to talk about because these are you know they're insets and they came let's kill the back face too uh, these are insets that came from booleans but as you can see there's no way there's no no angle like go to where they you know where they affect the silhouette there's just flat features so these can be killed so if i select those actually yeah let me just kill that face kill those out grab this top and bottom edge and rebridge it that is all we need to do for that face and you'll see you know when the bake gets done you'll see uh, what i mean by that um, i'm going to go ahead and and jump forward a little bit to where i've got all this uh wired up correctly hang on So that basically covers the low poly. Um, I have to say this prop kind of gave me the uh, the willies. It's just this is not my favorite my favorite topology. In fact, this looks like a, like a bit of a mess. But there's really not too much that can be done about it. There's just there's a lot of faces that need to connect to a lot of other weird faces and. We're just going to live with it and not worry too much about the aesthetics. Okay, great. But just know that it pains me. Anyway, so the next step is going to be to uh, to UV this thing. Now, what I likely will do, or would do at this point, is I also want to... Uh, were this a real game prop, I would take this back face and I would... I, I would carve it out some. Uh, you know, meaning that all the stuff behind here is not going to be seen, so there's no need for it to be on the UV map. But we're not going to worry about that right now because we're not doing this 100% correctly. So I'll make a UV map, and we'll start talking about UVs here. Now, since we're doing an object space normal map, um, yeah, we don't have to worry a whole lot about... Uh, edges. You know, for example, I can go ahead and just map this thing here, even though it's got a right angle going on here from the, you know, this face to this face. Uh, we will get away with just doing this, you know, just a flat map and a relax, and that's fine. Hide that. Now, the way I would go about UVing this is probably just to throw that down you know, as a planar map, and then hit this with a cylinder. Wrong one. There we go. You hit that with a cylinder unwrap and just be done with that. I could probably get a little fancier with that if I felt like it, but yeah, yeah we're going to keep things simple. Now this piece is the, is the one that will likely give us the most convulsions. Um, normally you would do stuff like you would take this whole piece here and carve that out to its own island and this to its own island and this piece and that kind of thing, but... Since we're doing an object space normal, we're going to just jam that onto one big relaxed island. Now, does that look ugly? Oh yeah, now that looks atrocious, but we're gonna hit it with a couple of different relaxes, some conformals, 
some adaptives. And even though I might not actually use this on a real prop like this, I probably would break it up some more. We're going to do this just for demonstration purposes. So let me unhide everything, do a quick pack. And this, uh, these will be our atrocious UVs for this bake test. So when I do my baking in Modo, there is, um, there's two different ways you can do the bake. I, I can add a texture to my low poly material and tell it that it's an object normal and just bake that way. And Modo will let us preview that right in the viewport. And we'll do that here in a second. Uh, the other way is to use the render targets, which are up here at the top of the tree, uh, the shading normal output. This uses the other renderer path that, you know, uh, renders to the render window. And when it gets done, you can save it out to a file. And, and that's what I do when I'm, uh, when I'm done with it. But for now, I'm going to throw a material or a texture on here and we'll just do some, uh, some test bakes. Okay. So I've just told the, or I've added the texture down here, uh, with the OS underscore normal name, just so I can you know, identify that I'm going to change the, now I've got this up here in my recent, it's called object normal. I believe this is normally down under surface shading. Yeah, object normal. That's where you find that. So that's telling Moto this is an object space normal map. And if I turn on the high poly and we can just go ahead and bake this uh, using a dist using a distance value. And that's one of the uh, the other advantages that I found with this object space normal flow is that you typically don't need a cage since the normals are all averaged. The cage is inherently averaged. So there's no technical difference between that and just specifying a value. So if I say, let's bake from objects to texture and I'll just give it a distance. Hang on. Uh, I installed window blinds the other day and sometimes, you know, it does goofy stuff. So we'll just put a distance of two in here and see what this bakes out like. Looks like that's going to be uh, pretty happy. Okay, so let's check this out here in the end. So you see what I mean here? Uh, even though we didn't bake a tangent normal, we baked an object normal that still works in the Moto viewport. Uh, it knows how to display the object normals. So you can see we made a good call here. This all seems fine. Yep. And this all baked out correctly looks pretty fine. There's some weirdness here and there. And we do have the big smoothing issue on top. So let's work through the issues. So the smoothing issue on top, this is because, you know, just looking at it, this is a huge nasty end gone, you know, as a result of the booleans and, uh, Moto doesn't really know what to do in terms of of smoothing that out. Although it's, it's flat, you think it would be able to, sometimes it has trouble. So uh, we're going to apply that same logic I did last time. Cause we can just select the green item, copy the polygons out, hide that, that mop Boolean, make a new mesh item and drop in the copied one. So now this is just straight polygons and we can do whatever we want with it. So what I'm going to do is utilize smoothing groups. And I know that I normally don't bother with smoothing groups, but they're handy for fixing issues like this. And you'll see what I mean. So I'm just hiding the selection here so you can get a good look at the polys. If I pull up the smoothing group UI and I just say, yeah, you're group A, then all that smooths together nicely and gets rid of the Boolean, you know, the Boolean floof. And, and I don't have to do anything to fix it further. So that should take care of that shading issue. And yes, we had to use a smoothing group to do it, but you'll see that if I rebake this and I'll just warp ahead. So zooming ahead to the finished bake, you can see now that those smoothing errors are gone. Yes, there's some banding and things like that, but that's just standard normal map stuff. That's not a smoothing error. So the smoothing looks, looks fixed now. Great. So we can move on to the next thing. The next problem I see is that these insets aren't being, um, 
it looks like the rays are missing or something inside. And what's actually happening there, uh, just to re you refresh our minds of what it should look like, you know, it's, it's got this nice inset piece and it should all be coming out nicely. Uh, the problem is that the bake distance I picked wasn't large enough. So that's the that's the offset you have to deal with when you're dealing with not using a cage. You have to pick a distance that's large enough to not only get outside the mesh to cast back in successfully, it also has to have a large enough distance that it can cast in far enough to hit all the geo. Cages do this automatically. Uh, when you bake by distance, you sometimes have to fool around a little bit to find the right value. So I'm going to up the value to say maybe four and warp ahead again. Okay. And there you see that warping ahead uh, with a distance of four, we now have, uh, we don't have that splooge in the middle anymore. We're getting all the way uh, inside that crevice and everything is working correctly. Okay. So the only thing really left, you know, everything else looks baked pretty cleanly. Uh, the only thing really problematic is the back plate. Uh, the back plate is a little spalugy. If I hide this front part, you can see we got some weird projections and stuff doesn't look 100% the way it should look. And we get these little bits down here. Now that's because uh, I, may, yeah, I may have gotten a little uh, overzealous on this... Uh, <laughs> on this UV island. You know, it's not a magical panacea. So the way to fix it is to either, let's see, you know, I, I, I'm by no means an expert on this, but what I believe we need to do is, is either tear off this, you know, these outside rings and put them into their own islands, you know, which will allow the space to project straight forward and get all the correct details. Or we can fuss around with doing, you know, an inset on the face like like this, which will give it, you know, space to correct the normals before it gets down to baking. But that's adding a but that's adding geo to the mesh that I'm not generally a fan of. Uh, but that is a valid solution. Well, you know what? Let's just do that. Let's go that way because sometimes I, you know, I have been known to do that. And this, in the end, may save you vertices, and I don't want to go too far into this, but tearing these, tearing these strips off will add vertices. Every vertex that gets torn off is going to be doubled because you're going to have it on two islands. And uh, doing it like this, you're adding geo inside of here, but that may end up being less geo than, it, than tearing off the edges. It's just kind of the way it works. Um, so once again, I'm going to bake this out and I'll be right back. We'll see what we get. Okay. Yeah, and as you can see, all the splooge that we were getting is gone. If I hide this top piece, there's the back piece is getting nice straight projection shot down to it now. And everything is looking good. Now, one thing you'll notice that I didn't do during all of this process and all of this troubleshooting, one thing I did not do, I uh, was mess around with the vertex normal map. Uh, not once did I have to go in there and harden edges or do any, or do like a recalculation or an averaging or anything like that. It was just straight up. Uh, my low poly material said 179 and turn off, you know, creasing and smoothing and that kind of stuff. And it just works. I can manipulate stuff. I can add geometry. I can move things around. I can UV in very aggressive ways and it all just works. So yeah, once you get used to things, you'll, 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 you'll avoid the common pitfalls like I encountered here, but yeah, it's just kind of depends how it works, works for you. This is working really well for me because I like not fussing with vertex normals. And to be honest, on a piece like this, I probably would add a cage uh, right from the start because I know there's lots of janky stuff in here and you know, a cage would just make things simpler. But for the purposes of the demo, I wanted you to see that you can just distance bake with a little bit of, of, of prep work. And 
you know, there is an old trick that if you add in, you know, that kind of geometry to fix the bake for object space normals, you can just delete them later. And it's not a perfect solution. You sometimes will, you know, skew your resulting mesh, but you can, you, you, you can get away with it. You know, under certain circumstances, you'll just have to experiment with it. Or if it even matters, you know, generally, uh, the nice thing with this workflow is that this is a very, um, say while the vert or the polygon count might be a little higher than you like, and we can still optimize, you know, don't, you know, don't get me wrong. We did, you know, we did this kind of sloppy, but you know, when push comes to shove, most game engines these days are concerned about vertices, not polygons. So having some extra polygons in here, but saving the vertex, you know, but saving the vertex breaks is actually a larger win in most cases, uh, especially an island like this, where I can just map the whole thing as one big globule. Uh, the only vertices I'm eating, you know, there's generally one vert per vert. So uh, the vertex count ends up being very, very conservative. And you know, that can offset for a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. So anyway, that's a lot of talking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spit this out to uh, you know, to an FBX file and save out that normal map to a Targo file. And we'll talk about how to get that into tangent space. Okay. Um, you don't need to adjust your monitor. That's just X normal. Uh, X normal. <laughs> It, it is it's famous for having a, just a terrible looking UI, but it's a very useful program. Uh, you, you, we generally don't bake in it anymore. And you know, the URL's right here. You go to xnormal.net and download this for yourself. But if you're gonna be doing what I'm doing, which is converting objects to tangent space normal maps, there's really only one thing you need to check. So when xnormal comes up, I hit the little plug graphic, hit the, where is it? Tangent basis calculators. There's only one, a MCT. Select it, configure. Make sure this checkbox is turned on. That um, generally, well, that helps with the conversion of, of whatever. Um, it's it's math programmer related, whatever. Um, just know you have to have that checkbox turned on for things to work successfully. Sorry, I'm speeding ahead. So jump to the tools tab and there's an object to tangent space converter right here. So you pull this up, it wants to know what your low poly mesh is, the object space normal map, and the tangent space normal map. It should probably label them that, but that's what it's looking for. So you just hit the browse buttons and pop in your fields. And once you've populated the fields, just hit the generate button and sit back and wait a few seconds. It's actually very fast. so. Yeah, uh, that generally goes well. And there we go. We have a tangent space normal map now. Now I, I'm going to very quickly pull this into Painter and throw a texture on it j just so you can see the end result. So we're in Substance Painter now. I've created a new project using that low poly mesh and our converted tangent space normal map. So I'm going to say, yep, this all looks good. Pull it in. So the first thing to check Actually, this is a little tip. When you pull something into Substance Painter, uh, just have a look at the mesh. Uh, make sure the smoothing is what you expect because sometimes the smoothing exports weird from Modo or whatever. But yeah, this all looks like one big smoothing group and this is what I'm looking for. So pulling down my texture set, if I go into my textures and pull my, pull my normal map over here and drop it on the mesh, you also just have a look at this and make sure that this is what you were expecting. This all looks good to me. Nothing looks inverted. Uh, I don't see any weird seams. Seems solid. Okay. Smoothing up top here. Looks good. Okay, great. So we do a quick bake of the other maps, turning that and that off. We'll just bake it 2048 so it goes quicker. But so generally that's all you have to do. And it's a pretty fast workflow because since you can test the object normal map right inside of Modo, you don't have to bake, export, bake, export. It's just as fast as it is with tangent space. So there's that rendered out. And if I just go into any old 
folder where I have some art materials and I'm like, how about this plastic material? Sounds good. Well, anyway, that looks kind of atrocious, but you get the idea. <laughs> you know, uh, this is baked out and I can texture it now and put it into a game and everything will be great. Actually, I'm going to import this uh, into UE4 just for a second because I want to show you what I was talking about with the vertex counts. Okay, so inside of, of Unreal Engine 4, uh, I just wanted to show that you know, when you, you, when you bring the mesh in, you still have all the smoothing that we had in Modo and Painter. Everything is one big blob, basically. I've thrown a basic material together and I've pulled the normal map in, but you'll see that if I just apply that normal map that we baked out, you'll notice that all of the smoothing snaps into place and corrects itself. Bang. There we have it. Everything looks nice the way it was. Uh, the toothing issue you're seeing up here, this, this grit is because I had thrown a smart material on it before I exported it. But you get the idea. You know, this is all nicely baked out, looks good. Yeah, etc etc and for a, you know, a super quick test we could even just throw a constant in here say 0.2 and throw that into the roughness and apply that yeah, we should give it some uh, some shininess somewhat yeah anyway there's some shininess you can see the normals are all holding up still and looking good so that's the basic walkthrough of what I do. It doesn't answer all of the questions, obviously, but it does give you an idea of how it works. And we'll, you will be doing this more and more in the future because this is what I do for all of my client work now and all of my asset packs and everything that I do because I just find this to be very fast. And, you know, I guess, honestly, it's not that it's faster than tangent space mapping, but I find it to be less error prone. And that's always a huge win in my book. You know, the less time I have to worry about, uh, why is there a weird seam here? Why is there a little splooge here? Why isn't this projecting straight? The less I have to worry about that crap, you know, the happier I am and the, and the faster I'm churning through assets, which as a freelancer means, you know, the faster I'm making money. So, oh, I talked about the vertices real quick. So let me open this up. And you can see up here, we have 1,100 triangles, and, uh, but the verts are you're hovering around 700. That's pretty good. Uh, anytime you can get the verts down to about half the triangles, you're usually in a pretty happy place. Uh, whereas, I, you know, whereas if I had a bunch of uh, splits that I would normally have to make, that'd be much higher. In fact, in fact I'm gonna jump back to Moto real quick and split this mesh up the way that you would split it up for tangent space baking and just pull it in here and show you the difference uh, uh, in the vertex count. Hang on. Okay, so I've gone ahead and I've torn, so looking at the UVs on, on the original mesh, you can see this is you know, uh, what we did in Moto. We have it uh, ripped down for object space normals. This one I ripped down for tangent space normals. And it looks the way you expect. All, all the hard edges have been torn off into their own islands and that kind of thing. Yeah, which has led to an increase in vertices from, from 705 to 849. Now, that is, now in this case, that doesn't seem like a gigantic leap. But if you, take, you, if you extrapolate this out to a, to a gun that has a bunch of hard edges on it or a larger prop or something substantial, not just some little wall deco piece, this, def, you know, this can definitely add up and can really cost you. So yeah, just uh, keep it in mind that one of the big advantages here is your your lower vertex count. And before I go, uh, we did say that we were going to talk about a super optimized version of this. And, I, and while I'm not uh, wildly crazy about doing that at this point, because I think we've covered all the ground we need to cover, I'll just quickly just show you what I was going to do. So. Yeah, we already did this inset, which is pretty much in the right position. So I'm going to hit that with a bevel, pull it out to about there. Uh, mm -hmm. Then grab this. 
can scale it down until it just about fits over top there just right. Not perfect, but pretty good. And then hide that, and we don't need this anymore. And we'll just have this here. And just to, to address the projection issues early, we'll give that a bevel inwards. Relax this out. All right. So we'll do it like a UV map on this. There we go. And he springs out to one big fat island. And we'll give him a pack. And uh, just for entertainment value, uh, I'll go ahead and bake this and we'll see what it looks like. Haha. -ha. So interestingly, uh, because this is such a large cavity in here, uh, my distance bake is is not reaching in far enough. And we talked about that on these side panels. That I, I, I probably could keep increasing that projection distance until it gets inside there and hits everything. But this gives us an opportunity to show the difference uh, with a cage, what I was talking about. This seems like a good candidate for a cage bake. So I'm going to quickly just throw a cage on here. And since it's pretty close to the high poly, we just have to give it the you know, the slightest of pushes just until it gets, you know, um, beyond everything, just like normal. Reduce that down. Now I'll bake it out with that cage and we'll see what it looks like. There. Yeah, and that demonstrates the uh, difference of baking with the cage. We got all the way in there and hit all of that, all those surfaces inside of there. Now this looks atrocious, I know, but like I said, this is a mega uh, aggressive bake. Yeah, there's almost yeah, there's almost no geo here. This is uh, really unfair to the renderer. But this is a heavy LOD piece. So let's say that we pulled those back into about where they're supposed to be and backed way up to where I was saying we were going to see this prop from. From here, it actually works well enough, right? And that's all that kind of bake is good for. It's not good for up close. But the whole point of that was just to show you the difference between specifying a distance and using a cage. Um, when it comes to object space normals, the way to think about the cage is that the cage is a shortcut to getting the exact right value for your distance bake. That's really all it is. And uh, I think that covers everything. I know this was a little bit rambly at points and I know it's a little bit long, uh, longer than I was anticipating, believe me. But I hope that gives you some kind of a look in, into what I'm talking about when I bring up the, uh, you know, uh, the object space normals and the way that I work these days. So uh, thanks for watching. Um, if you like what you saw here, you know, why don't you join up with the, uh, you know, the Discord chat channel? You know, we're always talking about game art or something else. You're, you're related to the industry. You know, it's a fun little group to be a part of. So the link is in the description. You click on it, check it out. If you think it's cool, hang out and talk for a bit. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.